now. Can we have an amen? Raise your hand if it feels good to be in the house. It does feel good to be in the house. We are going to uh, get to worship God today, and we can do that. Some of you folks online are, are still a little bit afraid to come out, but I want to let you know Mr. Chip Sivers is here. Give him a woohoo! <laughs> God is doing great things. He's pulling people out of their uncomfort zone and putting them into his comfort zone. And that's kind of what our story is all about today. How big is your God? So we're going to be sharing that. I do have a few announcements I want to share with you. Um, just so you know, we will not be taking up an offering. Uh, offering boxes are at the exit. If you came through the handicap, there's an exit there. Uh, and they're here, so you need to do that. If you're giving online, you can do that either by mailing in, dropping them off, or you can do that online with a click. So if you'd like to do that. Next week, we have one service. It's at 11 o'clock. We're going to try to consolidate a little bit. But you do need to get your reservation in, so please make sure you do that. Also, on the 26th, Leland and April, raise your hand. Woohoo! The people who are making it so we get to get online. Uh, so that means all you guys out there in video land, uh, we are having what we call a pantry, a pantry pounding. You're supposed to bring something for them on the 26th. If you can't be here that day or you still feel uncomfortable about being online, we'll have a basket outside in the commons area for you to actually drop stuff off, and we will present that to them at the 8.45 and the 11 o'clock service. So we invite you to do that, be a part of powering up their pantry. So is there anything you're allergic to? Eggs and cucumbers. They're allergic to eggs and cucumbers, so don't bring eggs and cucumbers. You can bring anything else. How about pickles? Uh, still a no. Pickles are still a no. So no cucumber products and, and no egg products. Just raw eggs, right? Regular eggs. Correct. Yeah, so that's good. All right, so, so that's what we have. Those are all the announcements I have, and I invite you now to center your heart and your mind and your soul as we put our lives and our, our heart into Jesus as we listen to the preview. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. O oh God, we come before you this beautiful day, giving you thanks and praise that we can go to you at any moment, that we can seek your wisdom, that we can seek to find comfort in you, that you will give us nourishment, not only for our souls, but for our bones, that you will provide all that we need. I come today and I thank you for the gifts that you have brought to us. And I thank you that you are a great God, even greater than we can begin to know. 
Help us this day as we look at your word to see just how big you are. Help us to understand the awesomeness of you as our God. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all the people say, amen. Our opening hymn of praise is How Great Thou Art. I invite you to read along, hum along, or do what the Lord leads. Should be down on the bottom of it. It's coming. There it is. Oh. 
scripture today as we've been journeying through the Old Testament we finally come to the place of the end of Job we talked about Job uh, the beginning of Job last week and this week we're talking about the conclusion of the story so I invite you to read along with me on the screen you'll see Job 41 through 14 and then 42 1 through 5 let's read that text together the Lord said to Job Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. 
I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor, and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Oh, my God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, as we come to this time of proclamation, we ask that you would be with us, that you would speak clearly to us in the discernments of our hearts. We ask that you would help us to understand those places where we don't see you as sovereign, where we don't see you as Lord of lords and King of kings, where we miss the true purpose of what we're called to be for you and not for ourselves. I ask that you would use me, O oh God, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing, a praise offering to you. And I pray that you would root out any place in me that is not fully devoted to you. It is in Jesus' name I pray and all the people say, Amen. I want to start with a story that happened back in 2015. Uh, Mike was struggling. He, he found himself coughing all the time. He was tired. He found himself when he was pushing the lawnmower on the front lawn, which is not very big in our house over in Virginia Beach. He found himself out of breath. And I knew something was wrong. He knew something was wrong, so I kind of pushed him to go see the doctor. And uh, when we went to see the doctor, Dr. B began to speak with him. His name is Dr. B. Buticherio. Buticherio. That's why we call him Dr. B. He's kind of got this long name. And so um, he kind of assessed Mike, and Mike was disagreed with his assessment. And I think that was because at that time Mike was leaving, living in Egypt. If you, if you everybody know what Egypt is, it's the land of denial. They were actually, he was denying his state. So Dr. B, with great wisdom, said these words to Mike. Mike, you have a heart problem. You need to get an echocardiogram to see what's going on in there. You have diabetes. You're 75 pounds overweight. You have high blood pressure. Your body is rebelling about the way you are living, and you are one sick man. Now, if you don't want to follow my advice, that's fine. Go get yourself another doctor. He was just blunt. But the neat thing about that was, it's exactly what Mike needed. I remember talking Mike down off his high horse, and Mike, I said, we need to do something about this, and we need to do it now. I want you to get the test, and I want you to listen to Dr. B. A lot of times we're that way, aren't we? We like to control our own destiny. We like to be in charge of what's going on in our lives. And he felt out of charge. Within a few weeks, we went and got an echocardiogram. I knew something was majorly wrong when the tech looked at the screen and said, we have to get this to your doctor immediately. Her face turned white as a sheet. 
Well, Mike didn't have a heart doctor at the time, so we were on the search to get a heart doctor. We finally found one, and we found out that Mike had three blocked arteries, a heart murmur, and also a bad heart valve. He only had 28% ejection fraction, or reject, ejection fraction, which is the way your heart beats and pumps the blood through. Normal is somewhere between 50 and 70. 50 is on the low scale. In summation, Mike had one very sick heart. And there I was in the midst of my own stuff. I was grieving the loss of my mother, who had just recently died, and Papaw taking care of Mamma, trying to run a church, and I thought, oh Lord, I don't think that I can handle any more of this. And at this point, you just know who I thought was in charge. Say what? You know, in the word sin, it starts with an S and it ends with an N. And what's in the middle? Big I. And there I was. Little did I know what was to come. God wasn't finished with me or Mike yet. Mike finally got scheduled for the triple bypass, which seemed to take forever, and the valve replacement. We arrived at 6 a.m. in the morning. The surgery uh, what actually took eight hours. It's supposed to only take four or five because there was major complications. I finally got to see him about 7 p.m. that night in the ICU. He was still intubated, and he was not doing great, but he was alive. The next day, they took him to Steptown ICU. They had unintubated him, and he was doing a little better. The third day, they finally took him to a room, and he was starting to recover. I said, I got this. Get it? I got this. I finally felt at ease and confident that God and I had this problem taken care of. But day three was a different day. It was sun Saturday night, and I was planning to go and preach the next morning. I had worked on my sermon. As I sat by his side, Rob was relieving me that evening, and he came in, and he was with his daddy that night. And it was about 3 in the morning that it happened. Rob noticed that there was something wrong, and he called the nurse. That night, Mike had a triple stroke, and he lost 95% of his motor skills. Rob called me in the morning, and he said, Mom, as soon as you get done with church, you need to come to the hospital. I said, Honey, did anything happen? He said, Oh, it's okay, Mom. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it handled. Just come when you can. I said, Are you sure? He said, No, Mom. You need to preach. I got this. Now, George understands this. My son, in his wisdom, knew that I needed to go to church that morning and to connect with God before I faced what I had to face. When I arrived that afternoon, I found myself going to the neurological ICU. And Mike was a totally different man. He couldn't move his arms, his legs, or any part of his body. He couldn't speak. About all he could do was move his eyes back and forth, and that was it. In just a few minutes, my whole world seemed to fall apart. And I remember telling God in that moment in my head, did you hear me say that I couldn't handle any more of this? And now you're giving me this, and that's when God called me down. He said, first of all, I want to remind you who is in charge. Not you, Tricia, but me. I felt like those words of Job were coming straight at me. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let the one who accuses God answer him. Secondly, God reminded me that I had been praying for a new heart for Mike. Remember that prayer you've been praying? Well, I'm doing that. And not only am I giving him a new physical heart, but I'm giving him a new spiritual heart that will love me and love you long, long time. I'm making you him into a godly man. And I need to say that I looked at Mike as a jellyfish, and I didn't see how God was going to do that. Have you ever been in a situation like that, where you just don't know how God's going to solve this problem? Basically, what God was saying, I'm in charge. You're not. 
I'm in charge of your life and Mike's life, and I know what I'm doing here. Imagine that. God knows what God is doing. I'm making it into what God made it. It was at that moment that I realized I didn't have the faith I needed to have in God. And I didn't know how big my God was. Over the next several months, God would begin to move in my heart, change me, begin to show me things about myself that weren't too lovely, and bring me to a place where I came to see how big my God is, and to come to know that God is in control. It's like the song, My God is So Big. In the beginning, God made everything. He set, uh, he, God simply spoke and the world came to be. He sent a flood and made everything new. He parted the sea and led his people through. He helped the boy bring a giant right down. Joshua marched and the walls fell to the ground. These acts of power are worthy of praise. But if you want to question my God and his ways, I'll look you in the eye and I'll say, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Today in our scripture, we find a man whose life seems out of control. He's lost his kids, his property, his money, his health, and there he sits in the ash heap with a pot shard scraping his skin. The only thing he has left is a nattering wife. That's not a good thing and three bad friends who are trying to steal his faith. And Job is sinking fast and crying out to God to vindicate him and to change his situation. I don't think I can handle this anymore. Job thought he had his life under control. And when bad things started to happen, this man of God begins to doubt God. Doubt God's justice and God's mercy, and God's power. For 36 chapters, he cries out to God to give him an audience. I want to talk to you, God. I expect you to talk to me, God. Have you ever been that angry with God? I've been there. <laughs> and finally, God gives him an audience. And when he does, it's as if Job has done a major faux pas, as God calls him into account. Okay, you want to talk to me? It's kind of like the parent who says, you think you're going to make it to third grade? <laughs> you get my drift? It was in that moment that Job realized he was not equal to God. It's in that moment that Job is humbled, and he sees the greatness of God. It's in that moment that he sees how big his God is, how omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and is ever more than he could ever imagine. And all he can do is shut his mouth. How big is your God? Has he ever left you speechless? Has he ever left you speechless? I want to take a look at this text because I think this text shows a time when Job and I put my foot in my mouth. And that's not a very comfortable place to be because we do do that. Can I have an amen? And I think if we know beforehand what we need to do and what kind of God we have, it changes our life. It begins with God challenging Job. Who will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Will the one who accuses God answer him? How many times have you questioned God? What God was doing, what God was thinking, possibly that you knew better than God? Oh yeah, I've been there. You probably have too. I honestly understand where Job was. I know what he was speaking from. He felt that God was absent in this agony. He was longing for a little bit of control in his life, and yet Job didn't understand what God was up to, and so he felt lost. He struggled with control, did he not? God's first speech. 
challenges Job to see God for who he really is. And then in the second speech, our text today, the Lord gets to the point. And he says, not only do you need to know who I am, you need to know that you are not the victim and that I am not the accuser. You see, how could Job possibly, in the light of all that God had shown him in the creation of the universe, in the way that life had worked in the past, accuse God of his nature not being Lord? That's why Job answers at that point, I am unworthy. I finally get to see I can reply. I put my hand over my mouth. Isn't that what these masks feel like? Put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I can say no more. It was with that change of tone, that humbling, that he truly becomes a man who begins to understand his situation. Like in the hospital when God called me down, I began to understand that no longer was I in charge and that I needed to shut up and listen. That act of putting his hand over his mouth is a demonstration of submission. You know, one can fall on their face, people can praise, and they continue to babble to God and forget to listen. But to yield the tongue is everything. To allow God to have the last word. There's a wonderful joke that goes like this. I always have the last word, says the husband. And then he says, Yes, ma'am. <laughs> God needs to have the last word in our lives. He needs to be the one that allows that substantial change. Now, remember that Job was still in his misery. God had not changed his circumstance. But something had changed in Job. God did not crush Job. His his friends tried to. They tried to steal his faith, put him down to zero. But God had not done that. He didn't even give him an explanation of his sufferings. But what he did was he allowed him to see how big he was. God, how big God is. And how small his life, Job's life concerns really were. You see, Job had gone through the suffering and didn't realize that God was there with him didn't realize that he could trust his life to God as a friend through the bitterness to fully realize that God had me. You know, when we enter God's presence, things change. All of a sudden, the light of God comes and shines on us, and we get to see how ugly and sinful we are. <laughs> Not a comfortable place, but yet a tro truly releasing freeing place. That's what Job realized. That his God was a big God. And his God had him. In the first speech, God humbles Job. But in the second speech, the Lord tells him that it's not only control over your life, it's control even over the moral order of the world. You see, Job was asking for justice. And he was discrediting God. God, you're not fair. You are not just. But that's when God comes back and says, Oh no, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. It was like that office visit with Dr. B when he was talking to Mike. You know, if you don't want to follow my advice, you can get another doctor. I can just hear God saying to Job, If you don't want me as your God, go find a better one. God was present to Job. In the midst of that strong storm, God didn't back down, but he spoke truth. He showed Job more than the creation. He showed Job his wicked heart and allowed Job to come to a place where he realized that God not only had control over the world, but control of the justice. It doesn't seem fair that Christ died for my sins. Does it seem fair to you? No, for that's justice. It didn't seem fair to Job 
that he was going through this suffering. But there was a greater thing at stake here. And the Lord needed to remind Job who God was. Did Job have an arm like God? Was he almighty? And where was Job's majesty and glory? Job begins to realize, not only through the first discourse, but through the second discourse, that God was supreme. I think sometimes we forget how big our God is. Job had no power to, to rush the wickedness away. He had no power to bring forth justice. Only God could do that. You see, he needed to let go and let God be God. Job and we too need to learn that. So often we try to control things. So often we lean on our own understandings. And you know what it says in Proverbs. We are not to lean on our own understanding, but trust in God. By the time we get to chapter 42, Job realizes his fault. In doubting God's justice and mercy and power, and he repents. It was after this humbling that Job replies to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. Do you know that, beloved, that he can do all things? No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke and I did not understand things too wonderful for me to know. Job's response shows that he understood. We all make mistakes. We all struggle to be where we need to be, to be in control, to understand that we've got it all together, but we don't. Can I have an amen? <laughs> and Job, at this point, realizes that God and God alone can put down evil. Job opened his mouth to tell God, I've gotten the message, and I don't have any response. I'm not worthy of any response. You created the behemoth and the Leviathan. You have created, you know that you can take care of my life. Oh God, I know that you know that my life is in your hand and I know that Job knew that too. Even with things like COVID-19, with race riots, with this crazy political stuff. You see, beloved, we have an awesome God. Do you know this God? Do you pray to this God? In the end, Job, who had finally heard about God, finally saw, encountered the living God, Pene'i Pene'i. That means face to face. He repented over his sin, and he realized that his suffering was for a purpose. Mike realized his suffering was for a purpose. Do we question God's motives? Do we question God's justice and mercy? Do we understand what God is doing? Of course not. But do we know how big he is? Do we trust in who he is? Do we know that he is a loving friend who does not want us to suffer unharmed I'm, I'm self, selfishly. He does not do that. There is a purpose and a meaning for all things, and God will bring us through and bring us to the transformational victory in the end. In the end, God restores Job's life. The scripture said, God blessed the later part of his life more than the first. And Job came to see how big is God. You see, I think the goal of suffering and trials in this life are so that we will not just hear about God, but that we will see him. We will experience his presence. Because when we see God the way we're supposed to see God, then we respond like Job. We stop elevating ourselves and our knowledge and our control, and all of a sudden we submit our lives to God. So what is God telling us about the suffering? He's telling us to trust him. Trust his wisdom. Trust his power. 
Instead of attempting to figure it out and answer, answer questions of why, he's telling us to let go. Pray, give it to him, and let go. Because when we do, we don't just know about God. We get to see how big our God is. Beloved, how big is your God? I want to close with the story, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. The rest of the story of what I call Mike after the stroke. God began to show off. He began to show his power and might and provision in our life. He brought together therapists and nurses and doctors and friends who all came and worked with us in the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual realm. In the whole being, he came and began to transform our hearts, pull back the veil of unknowing, and bring us into the place where we would see his plan. God showed up in a powerful way, and he humbled us, and he lovingly restored our lives and our souls as we got to see how big our God is. Now I know. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. How big is your God? Let us pray. Oh God, I thank you for showing off. I thank you for being a big God. I thank you for penetrating into my calloused heart, into all our hearts and lives. How proud we have been with our self-justification and complaints before you. Forgive us, O oh Lord, teach us to put our hand over our mouth and to do more than that. Admit that the problem lies within us. And that if we give it to you, put it lovingly back in your arms, that your redemptive grace will heal us and restore us. Oh, come, almighty God. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Holy Spirit, show off and show how big and mighty you are. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, and all the people say, amen and amen. As we come to uh, pray today, I want to let you know that Joyce Forrest has uh, had a stroke. She is in Riverside. And she will probably be there for a while. She did have a better day yesterday. Uh, if you want to call BT and talk to him, love him, reach out with notes and things, that would be great. Um, also, I want to let you know that um, Herman is still in the Newport. And I know he's not feeling up, so if you would drop him a card or try to call him, that would be great. Give Eloise a card, see what she needs. Uh, those are the ones that are right on the top of my heart. I know there's more. I know that, that there's several others who are struggling. I know that we've got a surgery coming up this week, so you need to be watching out uh, uh, for people. And I know that Edie has still got a shoulder thing healed. So uh, let's go to the Lord, and I'm going to let you, and we'll all lift up the names of those that are dear to our hearts. Father God, we come before you. I do lift up this community of faith. I thank you for their boldness to come in today. I thank you that they braved the circumstances and the inconveniences so that they could worship in your house. I ask, Lord, that you would be with those that uh, are struggling in this COVID time because of fear. And I pray that you would give them a holy boldness to step out in the name of Jesus. I also pray for eradication of this COVID virus. I ask, Lord, that you would come up with a solutions, doctors and nurses who can come up with solutions to heal this. I thank you for the video I saw this morning, and I just pray, Father, that that news will get out. I ask, Lord, that you continue to be with our government as they struggle with this divide, with racism, with all sorts of issues, political issues, trying to point fingers and trying to blast one another. I, I ask that you would uh, bind up Al-Tifa, and I pray that you would bind up any liberal, uh, radical things that aren't truth. 
uh, whichever side they're on, Father, that you would bind them up and you cast them out. We need your truth. I pray that you'd be with our, our officials that are in Washington. I pray that you would help them to play nice in the sandbox. They're not doing that very well. I pray that you would help President Trump to uh, be someone who would listen to you and would be humble and loving. I pray, Father, that you would continue to be with us as we try to give this information online, as we try to love one another, as we try to build up our community. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to be with those who are in need. I specifically lift up Joyce today, and I pray for healing for her body. And I ask that you would do that in the name of Jesus. I pray now that you would hear this, the prayers of your people, as we lift them up to your throne in heaven. all those prayers that we've spoken those that are still on our hearts and still are coming to our minds Lord we give you thanks and we lift them up to you this day and I pray Lord for our bishop who is trying to guide us through these times and I ask for wisdom for her I ask Lord also that you would continue to be with our HBT team as they are on the front lines and I just pray that you would keep us going forward I thank you for Leland, and I thank you that he's able to get us online, and I just ask an anointing on his ministry here. And I pray for those who are uh, new to our staff. I, I lift up Laurie, who's struggling with the health issue this morning, and I ask for your healing grace on her. And I ask that you continue to be with us as we are called to be a witness in this community. And I pray all these things through the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all the people say, Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is I Surrender All. I invite you to stand as you are able. Come, speak, whatever the Lord leads.
Lift your faces and receive this benediction. Go forth in the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Know he goes before you, surround you, uphold you, and infills you. Beloved, you have a big God. Go forth with him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.